As Pedro mentioned, I did my internship with the Caribbean Youth Environment Network, Barbados chapter. So the Caribbean Youth Environment Network is um, an organization across the Caribbean that aims to get youth engaged in like environmental matters. Um, I worked in the Barbados chapter. If you don't know, Barbados is a tiny, tiny country in the Caribbean. The population is 300,000. For context, the population of Chicago is 2.6 million. So it's very small. And I worked in this very small office, uh, this one room with two to three other people. Um, the project I worked on was hosting focus groups with Barbadian youth on their perspectives on climate change and climate justice. So we did focus groups followed by like an educational conversation, trying to dispel misconceptions about climate change. Um, and then at the end of my internship, I wrote a paper and policy briefs making recommendations for how to engage youth in climate justice efforts in Barbados that the organization is planning to send to policymakers. Um, for context, uh, Barbados is a climate change frontline community. Um, it is exposed to many climate threats, including the ones you see here. Um, it's also a climate justice frontline community in that um, Barbados society has very much been shaped by legacies of slavery and colonization. Um, climate change has been primarily caused by countries in the global north, so like Western European countries, America, and Barbados has, um, their wealth and resources have been extracted for a very long time by those very countries, meaning that they are in a lot of debt now and cannot afford to um, build the infrastructure and have the adaptations necessary to deal with the climate impacts they're experiencing. And then additionally, climate change exacerbates local um, social justice issues. Um, because of the legacy of slavery, there's high income inequality and high uh, that's like very racialized. Um, and that particularly impacts youth. And so climate change will exacerbate those existing inequalities. Um, and what we found in our results is that youth have this surface level knowledge of climate change. Um, they don't really know anything about climate change, but they have a lot of experience with climate impacts. They just don't know that they're related to climate change. Instead, they view climate change as like an academic specialization instead of an everyday personal issue. Um, and if they do know about climate change, they know about it in the global north. They know about it in America and Europe and the poles, but not in Barbados. What youth are concerned about are financial issues, especially unemployment and the high cost of living and also crime and violence. Um, but there is a demand for an interest in information about climate change. And we saw especially like there was this shift between our focus group and our educational conversation where people were disengaged and didn't know much during the focus group. But then when we started talking about climate change rooting in like local knowledge and climate impacts in Barbados, they were like interested, they were asking questions, they were engaged. And so the recommendations we made were that um, Climate change needs to become a like everyday, locally, culturally relevant issue in Barbados. And that has to happen through both formal and informal education um, that like centers the lived experience of people in Barbados and centers local knowledge rather than like jargon and academic language about climate change. And then in order for this to be consistent with climate justice, it has to be paired with efforts to alleviate what youth are already concerned about, which is primarily financial issues. And then this has to be led by Barbadian youth as a process in order to ensure that they have participatory power in the decisions that impact them. Um, so this was a really cool project that I was grateful to work on. However, my internship was really challenging for me. It really was not, it, was, it wasn't ideal. Um, the things in blue here are just like issues I had that I dealt with and I didn't really know how to. Um, the ones in green are the ones that I'm going to talk about right now that I tried to like find some solutions to. Um, the first thing is just that like I didn't want to be doing research. Like I wanted to learn about community organizing and I was placed in this research role. And the research product I was placed in was something I didn't know a lot about and my coworkers didn't know a lot about. Out. So I had to do a lot of like self-directed research on how to do this project that I didn't want to do in the first place. Um, and then I was excited to like be able to talk to Barbadian youth, but there were a lot of issues with coordinating the focus groups, which originally was not my role. Um, and we like I ended up talking to way fewer people than they wanted me to. Um, and so basically, I really tried to lean into like figuring out how to bring up tension and bring up new ideas in a polite and professional way um, and figure out how like as an intern you advocate for yourself and your needs and your ideas in a way that like does not you know usurp like your place in the organization particularly coming in as like an American to a Barbadian organization um, and over the course of my internship was able to like pitch ideas for getting more people to come to the focus groups um, and like express interest in, in doing other things in the organization, like going to, to meetings and stuff like that. Um, but it was also, there's also just like a lot of stuff that I didn't really know how to deal with. <laughs>
And uh, one thing that like really stood out to me in my experience here is that I feel like it was a really good example of the nonprofit industrial complex and in that like this is a small organization in a country that is disadvantaged within global power systems. And I felt like a lot of their time and resources were sapped up in trying to appeal to um like large wealthy organizations and institutions in the global north in order to get recognition and funding at the expense of the communities they were trying to serve um and it's made me really think about like how do we as people in the global north ensure that any work that we are doing for people in the global south is not colonial in nature which a lot of the work that happens through like the un i noticed um and various other organizations is um, that being said, like I still learned a lot, and I think I actually learned a lot through my own informal education in Barbados, just like by being there and talking to people. Um, I really thought a lot about how, like, what it means to be educated. Barbados is a really highly educated country, and yet nobody knows about climate change, which I thought was a really interesting tension and made me think about, like, what does it mean to be educated? How are we evaluating our educational institutions? Um, and also, how does that relate to, like, cultural suppression of resistance to oppression um, as, like, a pair to physical suppression to resistance to oppression? Depression. I saw a lot of like the impacts of neocolonialism, both from BRICS countries economically and from America culturally. I thought a lot about like my role as a South Asian American um, in standing in solidarity with movements for global uh, blackness and pan-Africanism, which I think like being in Barbados really helped me realize how important these movements are. Um, and then also like I am interested in climate justice and I wanted to go to this climate justice frontline community to learn more about my role in it. And what I realized is that like as an American, I think my best role is to hold American institutions and the government accountable for their role in the climate crisis and make sure they do something about it because ultimately like they are the ones with the power to do something about the climate crisis and Barbados as this like small island developing state isn't. Um, and so kind of just like overall takeaways I want to leave people with is that like honoring and valuing lived experience and local knowledge is a really essential part of human rights work but as an intern you are able to like advocate for your professional and personal needs and that's an important part of like what you're doing as an intern and then also like I just spent a lot of time feeling really conflicted and bad about the choice I made and like being mad at myself because I didn't want to, like I didn't get the thing that I wanted and I felt like I'd like squandered this opportunity and like it's okay if your opportunity isn't perfect you know like it's okay if your internship is kind of bad <laughs> like just take from it what you can and you don't have to put this insane amount of pressure on yourself to like make the most of this once in a lifetime opportunity <laughs> that's all so thank you. Um, unfortunately, Sandy has to head out, um, so we'll not stay for the Q&A, but that was really great uh, to hear about. I'm sorry that it wasn't exactly what you wanted, but I'm happy that you got the most out of it, it seems like. And we chatted halfway through the, through the uh, internship program, so it seems like some of the issues were resolved, but not all of them. Um, but, but yeah, I think making the most out of it is sort of definitely really, really good advice. Um, uh, okay, so up next, um, is uh, Delia Cunha, who worked uh, at Catholic Legal Services of Miami. Hello, um, I'm Delia, and um, I worked at Catholic Legal Services, as was just said, during the summer. Um, the Catholic Legal Services of Miami is an immigration clinic with the mission of providing legal services to those who come to South Florida and lack the means to obtain um, legal help. And I personally really admired that they um, aim to provide services, um, both legal advice and direct representation to all immigrants, regardless of like sex, national origin, or like any distinguishing characteristic, um, despite the fact that it is like um, named a Catholic organization, it like really was not specifically um, targeted towards helping Catholic immigrants. Um, it just had like a general um, giving back um, kind of quality to it. Some of my regular a task included scheduling and conducting intakes for the unaccompanied children that came across the border, um, filing court documents, translations, um, putting data on spreadsheets, uh, things like that. And then weekly, I delivered charlas, which were virtual information sessions to the unaccompanied minors uh, sponsors. 
And then sometimes the children would also join onto the information sessions, which was cool to see them as well. Um, but the sessions were like primarily targeted towards the sponsors and like informing them of the immigration court uh, process that the children would have to go through and their responsibilities as sponsors. And then I also got to experience some other cool experiences. Like on my first day there, I attended a pro bono clinic at a bigger law firm, Ackerman in Florida, for families filing asylum applications. And I was also able to actually file the asylum and SIG applications for the UACs um, by myself, which was really cool. And then on top of that, I also got to draft a legal motion in shadow really um, passionate attorneys. But like all other interns, I did face some unique challenges. Um, I, well, I think this is more of like a general um, problem, I think that occurs in like the human rights field is supporting clients with trauma. So I personally had to do in intakes with children that had experienced trauma uh, while crossing the border in their home country or in the US. And I could tell that it was really difficult at times for them to give me or tell me about their experience. Um, also doing legal, I wanted to do legal work during my internship, um, getting that legal experience, but I really have no prior legal experience and I hadn't taken any, any legal courses as an undergraduate. So I feel like that's kind of um, a problem when you start trying to get into your career field, but you don't really have any experience um, that I experienced this summer. And then also just dealing with difficult clients in the nonprofit sector. Um, I'm not sure if this is unique to the nonprofit sector, but I had a lot of clients just not show up to the intakes. And at first I was a little confused because I thought, well, if these people uh, can't afford to get legal assistance on their own, why are they not showing up to the appointments where like we are trying to help them uh, for free? And some of the relevant skills and qualities that I think are important when addressing these problems are first empathy and flexibility. Um, as part of our team, we had a social worker who really emphasized the importance of being sympathetic with the children and trying to be um, transparent, letting them know that we are really just trying to gather more information about their particular cases because we want to assess their case um, in the best way in order to give them like the best advice about legal relief that they can seek and that they don't have to give us any information that they don't um, feel comfortable giving us and that we're willing to work with them no matter how much um, information they feel comfortable giving us. And then on the other hand, um, I realize that you do have to be strict and direct at times. Um, especially whenever I first was scheduling the intakes, I real over the phone, like I realized that you have to be very um, strict and and direct and let the let the clients know that there are serious consequences for them not showing up to their appointment. And one of those included being added to our three hundred plus waiting list. And uh, like that was kind of hard for me at first to tell them like, oh, you guys, if you don't show up, you're going to be added to the end of our list. But um, that was really important in order to um, be able to make the most out of the organization's uh, resources. And then also just being a good problem and decision maker, I think is important in any career field. I had to make a lot of important decisions on my own. My supervisor was actually gone for like the first two weeks and then the last four weeks of my internship. So I had to make a lot of independent decisions um, like um, restructuring the interview uh, process and scheduling process and that was um, something that helped me address my problems. And then just some key takeaways. Key takeaways, um, I'll just say one of them. Um, I think it's really important to get experience in a field that you're interested in because the theory and the practice of the field can be very different. Um, I knew that I really liked human rights and work and uh, legal work and immigration work. But then when I actually did that kind of work in the nonprofit sector, I found that I didn't really like so much the nonprofit sector aspect of it, though I still liked um, the general legal work and um, immigration work. So um, I feared that maybe in the future, I would still want to pursue human rights 
and law, but maybe not the nonprofit sector. Great. Uh, thank you, Lilia. I'll definitely want to be hearing more about what challenges you face in the nonprofit sector specifically. So, um, but before that, let's uh, all welcome Madeline Hopper, who worked for the Hyde Park Refugee Project, to tell us about her internship. Hi, my name is Madeline. Um, I'm a third year in the college. And this summer, I worked as the camp coordinator for Hyde Park Refugees Project, Hyde Park Refugee Project's English Language Learning Camp. It's a long name. Um, so camp, camp is free. Um, this summer we had 70 children who attended camp, um, with 23 languages spoken at camp every day, um, and 45 staff members, um, all of which who I supervise. So we had five college interns and then 30 high school counselors, most of which went to lab school, um, or other schools around here. So what does a coordinator do? I didn't really know either. <laughs> um, so my job started before the summer. I started working at HPRP in January. Um, I was involved in our hiring process for our interns. I was involved in writing grants before camp started. Um, and then once camp actually started, a lot of my responsibilities were kind of the day-to-day -day of camp. So I was the first one in the building every morning and the last one to leave. Um, I was the point person um, for the other um, interns and counselors at camp. So if someone wasn't able to come, if someone was sick, if someone didn't get paid, they would contact me. Um, and then I was in charge of kind of managing the schedule of camp. So that means like if we had a special, if we had a field trip, whatever that um, entailed for the day. And then finally, my favorite job was I was the direct contact with parents um, and so every morning I would greet kids at the door and have their parents sign them in. Um, and the first weekend of camp, I took home the list and I studied the names. And so the next week I could remember every single kid's name um, and greet them by name at the door. So their parents knew that I knew who they were and that they were really welcome at camp. So my wins. Um, so I have three here. <laughs> The first is that for the first time, we had an English language learning program that was directed by um, a professor of English language acquisition. Um, she helped with the kindergartners through third graders um, and helped guide me through the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade English language learning curriculum. Um, so as you can see, the seventh and eighth graders did a fun curriculum about the World Fair, um, and that ended in a trip to the U Chicago archives. So they got to work with an archivist at the library. Um, and then we got to do a tour of the university with the tour guide. This was really fun because most of the kids I worked with lived in Hyde Park, but had never been inside a university building. Um, and so for me, it was like a really exciting experience. Um, in addition, I wrote a grant and secured the funding for us to do an additional field trip in a Monarch Butterfly Club where um, our camp had butterflies. And <laughs> we watched them grow and their educators came to camp. And then we took a fully funded field trip. Um, so those are a few things I did. I think working in a small organization meant that the things that I really thought were important, we could do. Um, whether that was, you know, making sure that kids knew kind of about the college admissions process and what um, University of Chicago looks like so close to their house it was great. My favorite funny story is I was talking with a kid and I was like, how did you like the University of Chicago? And he was like, I've heard about this place called Harvard. <laughs> I was like, I, I can't take you to Harvard, but I'm, <laughs> I'm glad. Um, so this is what I learned. So the first thing is I really enjoyed direct service. Um, I felt like being able to work with people was really impactful. Um, and even more, I really, really enjoyed working in Hyde Park. Um, more than anything, I think my internship made me feel like a part of the Hyde Park community. I see the parents every day. Some of them work at the University of Chicago. Um, I see the kids all the time. One of them lives in my apartment building. Um, and so making sure I maintain those relationships is really important. Um, I go over to the park every time I see a kid and say hello and ask how the year is going. Um, and actually, a few of them watch my cat when I go away for a night because, you know, I've been so involved in their family that I kind of want them involved in mine. Um, and thinking about my own career, um, I really enjoyed working directly with people. I know I said that, but I'm now thinking more about social work and kind of more direct service and programming. Um, so yeah, I would, my advice would be to take a leap. 
Um, I was thinking about going into a more structured, formal corporate role. And while I think that's really awesome for a lot of people, I'm so glad that I (laughs) decided to be a camp coordinator instead. Um, It provided me with kind of invaluable experience. And it's not something I would have been able to do without the Posen Center. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Madeline. Um, that sounds like a really great opportunity and, and very nice kind of contrast in the hyper local. So definitely want to hear more about that. Um, up next, um, and I'm sorry for not clearing the pronunciation before this uh, of your name. Um, but up next, we have uh, Adwara Mkansa, uh, who worked at the National Immigrant Justice Center. Uh, good morning. Um, so this past summer, I worked with the National Immigrant Justice Center. Specifically, I was working with their asylum team, um, just as their general intern. Um, so the National Immigrant Justice Center is part of a larger branch of nonprofits um, under the Heartland Alliance. And their mission is that they're dedicated to ensuring human rights protections and access to justice for all immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. So we provide legal services to more than 10,000 individuals each year. Um, and most of that is through direct services. And we have a success rate of about 90% obtaining asylum. Um, Generally, that rate is about slightly under 50%. So it's really significant that this organization is able um, to have so many success stories. Um, And the organization provides both direct legal services, which is the bulk of the work. And it also advocates for immigrants by encouraging policy reform, impact litigation, education, et cetera. So we actually have another branch in DC that is more focused on like lobbying and political whatnot, and then the branch in Chicago is the headquarters and provides direct legal services. Um, So there's different, um, like, sections underneath um, NIJC that target specific um, needs of immigrants. So there's one that is focused on family reunification um, and also provides just general immigration services. The one that I worked with is the asylum seekers and refugees one. Um, There's another team that focuses on unaccompanied immigrant children, uh, another one that focuses on LGBTQ cases, um, survivors of gender-based violence, and then finally people who are currently being detained. Um, so to begin with, I kind of wanted to talk a bit about asylum law because I think that that was honestly one of my biggest takeaways. Um, one thing about asylum law is because it's so implicated in politics, it's constantly changing and you constantly have to stay up to date. But the general, um, like body of asylum law in America comes from the UN conventions that outline the rights of refugees. Um, So an asylee specifically meets the definition of a refugee and then is somebody who's also already left their country of origin. Um, And so the definition of a refugee is a person that is unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin because of a well-founded fear of persecution or torture perpetrated by the government or a non-governmental entity that the government is unable or unwilling to control on account of their race, religion, nationality, political opinion, really imputed, or membership in a particular social group. And I feel like over the course of my internship, I had to say that at least like four times every single day um, because the way that asylum law in the U.S. works is you have to prove every single part of this. So you have to prove that the person is unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin. You have to prove they have a well-founded fear, so on and so forth. Um, so it's incredibly discretionary. Um, judges have a lot of leeway. Um, and I don't think that I realized just how discretionary the asylum law um, system is because that is such an, a subjective like how do you determine if somebody is unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin or if they actually have a well-founded fear um but 
there are two forms of asylum law. There's the affirmative, which is where you declare yourself as an asylum, and then the defensive, which is um, people who are in removal proceedings. But receiving asylum status is incredibly significant because it gives you, you know, legal status in the country, but you also receive work authorization. You can petition to bring your family members into the country. You can apply for a social security ID and you're eligible to receive certain forms of government assistance like Medicaid. Um, and then after a year, you can apply for permanent residency. So the people that we were working with had a lot at stake here. Me specifically, I was interning with the in-house asylum team, as I, as I mentioned. So it was a small group of legal professionals, about like five or six of us, and we provided direct legal services um, for asylum cases to clients that are not sent to a pro bono partner. So the majority of clients under NIJC are sent to like partners that the organization has that are giving their services for free. Um, but there's also some cases that remain in-house. Um, and so me specifically, I conducted intake interviews, which is where I spoke with people who are interested in seeking our services and determined if they were eligible. I completed a country conditions indices, which was um, used for their case to um, determine like the actual case uh, conditions in their country and to provide support for their experience. Um, and then I also did affidavits, which was like a written uh, testimony. Um, so my key takeaways, um, divided into like personal and professional takeaways, I think personally the job really reminded me of the realities of life that different people around the world face. Um, I'm originally from Ghana, but I've been, I think, so separated being in the U.S. that it's easy to forget that there's actual people um, my age that are living through some really intense things. I learned a lot about work-life balance. I think that because it was so emotionally straining, I had to make sure that I was taking care of myself um, and also emotional regulation, particularly when I was working, um, doing affidavits, you had to know like all the intimate details about a client's like experience, especially with persecution. And it's also as your, um, as their provider, you have to um, ensure that you're regulating your own emotions because they're the ones who um, actually experience these things. And I don't want to, um, be, I guess, projecting my own emotions onto them. And that was very difficult for me. Um, I learned generally about American immigration policy. And then professionally, um, I think the internship was like an intro to asylum law 101 class. Um, and then I learned like just general um, skills such as communication, legal writing through the briefs and the country conditions indices, um, networking with other um, legal professionals, and then I just got experience in the field. I learned that I really love this, um, and so we'll likely be continuing um, in immigration law, excuse me. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. That, sound, that sounds like a really, really great opportunity, and, they, and I just see there's a lot of really good work, so uh, I'm happy, uh, Posen, uh, you were able to do your internship there through the Posen Center. So last but not least, uh, for this morning's uh, first panel, we have uh, Promise and Gearway, who worked for Physicians for Human Rights. So, welcome, Promise. Good morning, everyone. My name is Promise. I'm a fourth year human rights major on the pre med track, and I interned for Physicians for Human Rights this past summer. Um, so, PHR is a New York based not for profit that has a global network of thousands of health professionals, lawyers, human rights researchers, and activists across five continents. Um, PHR has several areas of work. They work to end torture and ill treatment, speak out for the right to protest safely, halt the use of excessive force by police and security forces, safeguard the rights of health of asylum seekers, increase accountability for attacks on health care, and also increase accountability for sexual violence in conflict zones. So PHR as an organization does a lot, but I interned specifically for their program on sexual violence in conflict zones. And this program focuses on ending impunity for sexual violence in conflict zones by investigating and documenting sexual violence in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Ethiopia, Kenya, 
Iraq and Ukraine. Um, and as a pre-med student with a major in human rights, I felt like this internship kind of offered the perfect opportunity to in intersect my interests in medicine and human rights. Um, and so the Sexual Violence and Conflict Zones program has five pillars. In terms of research, PHR research in, into patterns of sexual violence. Capacity development looks like bringing together medical, law enforcement, legal, and judicial professionals together to learn about how to properly collect, safely preserve, securely transfer, and ultimately interpret and use forensic evidence of sexual violence in a court of law. Um, PHR also advocates for national and international reforms to overcome the political, legal, social, and cultural obstacles that hinder prosecution of sexual violence. Um, they also build networks among doctors, nurses, police officers, forensic analysts, lawyers, and judges. Um, and during my internship, my work was more so focused around the tools, resources, and technologies, um, which I will talk about a little bit more. Um, so in 2021, almost 24,000 grave violations were committed against children in armed conflict zones. Um, and one significant factor largely contributing to these instances of sexual violence in conflict zones is impunity and the lack of accountability for perpetrators of sexual violence. Um, so PHR has developed these two technologies, MediCapt and Vivimo, that capture and preserve evidence of sexual violence. So MediCapt is an app which enables cl clinicians to securely document, store, and transmit evidence of sexual violence. Um, this evidence strengthens investigations, increases prosecutions, and helps ensure that perpetrators of sexual violence can be tried and convicted for their crimes. And then Vivimo is a voice modification system um, which protects victims and witnesses of sexual violence by allowing them to testify without being identified by defendants um, by distorting their voice. Um, and so throughout the summer, I helped prepare a fact sheet for Vivimo to be sent to potential donors and also to be posted on PHR's website. And I also assisted with several other projects. Um, one of my primary responsibilities involved assisting in the development of security protocols for PHR related travel to their field offices in the DRC, Ukraine and Rwanda. Um, I also helped manage a weekly regional update for the team on local news reports and security alerts for PHR's regions of work. Um, I also assisted with some literature reviews. Um, for instance, the team was planning to adapt a specific protocol for conducting forensic interviews with children um, in twin language. So my task was to research existing adaptations of the protocol and relay the different procedures that are used to adapt the protocol to the team. Um, also just did some note taking during meetings. Um, and yeah, I think, skills that would be helpful for this internship are research, writing, and communication, but also I think the tasks that I did um, and that interns do kind of help refine those skills as well. Um, one thing I would note is reading and learning about sexual violence can be emotionally challenging. Um, so just taking the time for yourself and learning about vicarious trauma and learning the best way to manage that for yourself is very important. Um, and yeah, thank you for listening. All right. All right. So now I'm going to invite the panelists to come up and sit here. We're going to have a, a, a little q and um, I'll get us going. But hopefully, if folks are on Zoom, they will ask questions. If folks are here, um, please uh, ask your questions. As I said at the beginning, folks don't want to hear from me. And this is also an opportunity for you all to learn about what uh, the internships were like and whatever you want to learn. Um, but just to kind of kick us off, I wanted to just highlight the fact that um, just within the five presentations, even just within the four people that remain on the panel, we had internships that were working at the uh, local level, at the state level, at the national level, and the international level, right? So in, I think that that's really cool how human rights work can uh, translate into kind of any level uh, of government or or, or uh, size of institution. Um, and so I, I want to I, I wanted you all maybe to reflect on on that piece. Uh, 
and think about whether uh, the, the level of, at which you work that change your perception on the issues in any way, uh, the issues that you were coming into work with. And I hear I mean specifically the human rights issues, not necessarily the the kind of work, I think we'll get there to the kind of work that you're doing. Um, but but did you think differently about say immigration law or you know direct services based on um the kind of institution you were at and, and the kind of uh um population you were serving? So why don't we start start with that and um, and see how it goes and we can go well in whatever order you want. Some of my thoughts. I can go ahead. I definitely feel like, yes, it, it definitely changed a lot about how I understood immigration law and also like the human rights abuses that are happening around the world. I was working on a very like one on one basis, but also it kind of was at all levels. It was also um, providing services to the Chicago community, but also engaging with national law and uh, situations that are happening around the world. I think that I realized just the extent of how unfair the immigration system is and how set up almost it is against immigrants. Um, and also just how, like at the same time, how awful things are, like how, how awful things that are happening around the world are. Um, and so it's kind of weird because it's like now I know that things are worse than kind of how I can understand it, but also I'm learning that the system only lets 50% of asylum applicants um, receive the status. Um, so that was kind of, I don't even know the word like disappointing, but I think it further uh, increased my commitment to the work that I'm doing and like knowing that an organization like um, NRJC can increase an applicant's prospects all the way up to 90%. I can go. Um, so my um, organization was working at the local level, like helping um, immigrants in the Miami area, and um, it wasn't it wasn't a state um, affiliated organization, and it also wasn't um, like a big private corporate um, law firm. And I remember on the first day of my internship. Mm, the immigration the immigration attorneys took me to a pro bono clinic that was um directed by a bigger private firm and I remember them telling me that they were just doing the pro bono clinic for show and that um to some extent they didn't really care so much about whether those immigrants actually filed their asylum applications and whether they won their case they were just kind of doing that like for show and I think um, that's not the case with all big law firms but I did realize that local organizations to, to some extent have a more direct and close connection with their clients and the people that they're working with and um i don't i don't i don't know yet if like i would i that's what i prefer because i haven't like actually done work with a firm um but i think it was really important for me to see that side of law and i really appreciated like being able to work with a more local organization that was um that did allow me to have a closer connection with the people that I was helping. Yeah, I also <clears throat> worked at the local level and I think one of the hard, well, first I think it was really cool because I felt like a lot of the theory, <clears throat> I'm a human rights minor, um, a lot of the theory I'd learned about, I could see um, kind of in like a micro. So for example, there are no English language learning teachers in Hyde Park public elementary schools. And there are um, at least 50 plus um, English language learners at each. So being able, I think you can see that in the national scale and be like, that is messed up. But to be able to meet those individuals and see it um, and see how that impacts their English language learning, like individually to me was really um, like demonstrative of kind of the theories and problems that I was working on. Um, but I also felt it was a little frustrating because first we took 70 kids, which means we rejected a lot more. Um, and so I felt like a lot of the time we were working on like 
the symptoms instead of the causes, which I think is how a lot of human rights work, but um, is what I felt was a little bit limiting about working at such a local scale. Yeah, for PHR, although all the areas that they work in are kind of operating under this sexual violence and conflict zones, um, each different area kind of had different factors kind of contributing to sexual violence. So I think um, just being on that team and learning how kind of cross-cultural adaptations are necessary to kind of implement the initiatives um, in an effective way. Um, and that's something I saw throughout my internship. Um, are there any questions? I have some more, but I'd rather open it up. Okay, all right. Um, so kind of following off of that and something that you all touched in your presentations, um, moving on to sort of like more the nitty gritty day to day, I'd like to highlight some of the differences in terms of working for uh, a smaller organization, maybe the challenges of, of working a nonprofit, if you can talk a little bit more about that versus, or a smaller nonprofit versus working for, I think what are, they are nonprofits, but they are larger to have more of a, uh, I, I don't want to say corporate necessarily, but, but yeah, like a corporate structure, it's, it's sort of very well established, very clear timelines, right? It's not as flexible, et cetera. You know, I, I don't think that one is good and one is bad. I think that they're just very different. And perhaps people in the audience would like to hear about um, what each of them looks like to see, hey, you know, this sounds better for me, right? Um, so if you can tell us a little bit about what you liked and what you didn't like so much um, about the about the day-to-day, -day, uh, that, that would be great. I can go. Um, one of the things that I noticed was like working with a smaller nonprofit organization was that it wasn't, it was not really like established. Um, and people would walk in the door and just like, I mean, because we did um, allow like people to come in the door and like we would help them, but it was just like so many people and a lot of them were there to seek help with like, um, no, they were like immigrants, but they were seeking help with like maybe um, um, a crash incident. They needed like legal help with that or like they needed uh, legal help for like an adult case, whereas my office only worked with children. And it was just really hard telling them no and um, being like, no, we can't help you. Like, this is strictly for children. You can go to this place or you can go to this place. Um, it was really hard and it also felt really chaotic at times. And uh, I'm not really sure that I liked that part, but on the flip side, it was very like different every day. Like you would interact with like different people and you never knew what was coming. So that was kind of, um, a fun aspect of it. Yeah, I think one thing that was a little unique to me is that I was essentially like the boss. Like I was directly overseeing everyone um, that I worked with. Um, and so while that was great because it meant that like we were pretty swift and agile, right? Um, but what was hard was we didn't have a lot of checks and balances, which meant when I made a decision, like sometimes I wouldn't know if that was the right one and there was no one to tell me. Um, and so I think that if you're going to work at a small organization, what I wish I had known is to pay really close attention to who your supervisor is going to be. Um, and if you think that is someone who can provide you direct and valuable, like feedback and experience, because I felt like I kind of didn't get a lot of that. Um, and so I got feedback about my leadership through the people, the interns and the counselors, but I didn't get any from um, my bosses. And so that was a little challenging. Um, so yeah, my biggest advice in a small workplace is kind of pay attention to who your coworkers are and who's going to be supervising you. Yeah, I kind of worked for a larger organization. Um, they have five different offices across the world, but the team that kind of managed all of those was also pretty small. It was about 10 people to manage all those different offices. Um, and I think that kind of showed me that um, just a career in human rights, you got to wear a lot of hats. I felt like a lot of my supervisors, um, they did a lot like research, funding, grant writing. Um, so they each had a lot of different tasks that they had to undergo, um, even though it is kind of a larger organization. 
Yeah, similar to Promises Experience, I worked at a um, pretty large organization, but in a small team, um, and got very close to my team. And I think unlike other larger organizations, I was doing a lot of direct work with clients. Um, but I guess the only drawback is I didn't really know other people at the organization um, outside of my team. Um, and also at times the work would get um, monotonous if it wasn't working with clients. A lot of the time it was researching country conditions um, or writing up um, my notes from an affidavit interview. And so it was usually like sitting at a computer for like eight hours, like four days a week. And even though the work like that I was researching was always different, um, it could at times get a bit like, you know, like very bureaucratic. We had to enter every single thing that we did into like the, the company log, which after having worked at smaller organizations, they're not really as diligent <laughs> about that, that in OGC you had to be like very intentional about writing every single thing that you did and like an interaction that you had with the client down. Um, but yeah. Okay, well, I'll keep going. Um, so, so yeah, th thanks for sharing that. And I hadn't thought about asking this, but given um, all the answer I got, uh, I want to talk about a little bit about the how you kind of managed, what support systems did you use to kind of, uh, both from a professional's uh, perspective, but also, you know, all of you talked and touched upon the uh, difficulties surrounding about uh, working uh, with victims of trauma, right? And so, um, I mean, and I mean the question in the professional sense as, you know, if you don't have a supervisor, right? Um, who are you turning to? Is it, uh, are you turning to other people? Are you turning to, you know, your friends? Are you like on the group chat, right? Are you turning to your parents, your family? Um, and, and similarly, right, even if you don't have a supervisor, how are you using external um, support? Maybe, maybe how to pose and help out, if at all. Uh, you don't have to say that we did. Well, can we do better? Um, but, uh, but yeah, so how, how did you find support throughout the internship? Um, whether it was, there was not really, there weren't a lot of people around or there were a lot of people around, but I didn't know them. So if, if you can talk about that. Well, for me personally, I learned a lot on my um, coworkers. I'm very introverted, so it was quite difficult for me. Initially, my first day we went on like a team walk um, and I realized very quickly like, uh, and I just see the teams are kind of like, I hate to use the term families, but everybody really did like support each other whenever we would have a loss, like um, like a, a loss in a case, everybody was very close to each client. Um, so we would support each other in a way that I think that my family and my friends could not offer me. Um, but I also, of course, learned a lot on my family and my friends. I made sure I communicated to them before um, the summer that I was going to be working in this position and like sometimes I just would call my sister and like chat about my day or debrief and I think it's really important um to let those things go um I also later on asked my supervisor because after a while the initial toll got to be and she talked a lot about separating um our work from my personal lives for the like purpose of being able to give our all at work. And so she had a very strict like boundary of not checking like her work laptop after work hours, unless it was like a client directly calling her, but like she wouldn't like really interact with um, the, the bureaucracy of the organization. And I think that she's been in the field for like decades and she said it worked for her. I really started implementing it like my last two, three weeks and I found that it helped, but yeah, it was definitely a, a work in progress figuring out how to navigate on the emotional toll of the job. Yeah, I um, didn't really have a ton of coworkers to lean on. I felt like because I was a supervisor, like I was around a lot, actually a lot of my, um, the interns and the counselors would express to me, like I'm dealing with this, um, you know, trauma, because even during the summer, things happen, right? People's families are still in these countries. And so also like, that's why 
I have no faces in my um, slideshow because it's really important working with refugees that we're not giving away information about them, um, especially if their families are still like in countries and could be at risk. Um, <clears throat> so I would kind of hold a lot of my coworkers from them, but what I would do is I would turn my phone on do not disturb at 7 p.m. Um, and I would not look at it. And because I worked with kids, kids are really funny. Um, and so instead of kind of going home and telling the sad stories, I would think about them on my way home. And then I would tell my coworker like the ridiculous thing a kid said to me. Um, and to me, that was kind of enough to be able to have that like commute. That was my like sad somber time. And then to kind of focus on the parts of my job that I really loved. And yeah, do not, don't, don't check your phone if you don't have to when you're off the clock, because I do think it drains part of you. Yeah, I agree with that um, um, with what has been said. But I think also before going into the um, summer internship, it really helped that I'll be that person that the uh, human rights program had us do uh, workshops like the trauma workshop. And I think that really prepared me, it, like um, prepared me mentally that I knew that I was going to have to deal with um, people who had a traumatic experience and so just like being prepared ahead of time kind of helped me and then also leaning on my coworkers, um I did my, I didn't have my supervisor to help me out for most of my internship and I think it really helped that I had like paralegals that were a little bit older than me they were uh they had already gone their bachelor's and were waiting to um they were taking a break before going into law school and so they were kind of um in a boat like that I knew I was going to be there like in a similar uh, age to me and being able to talk to them was really helpful and then also just reaching out to other people on my team um, despite the fact that I'm also kind of like shy um, I realized that reaching out to people like on my team would be really helpful and it was kind of like uh, necessary. Yeah, um, I think just due to the nature of working with sexual violence survivors during my onboarding, there was like many modules on vicarious trauma and self-care. Um, and my supervisor was super helpful during my whole internship. Um, she was always adamant about taking breaks, um, taking time for myself if it got too emotionally um, draining. Um, but I think it's a balancing act also trying not to like detach myself fully um, emotionally um, because I think the emotions of it is kind of what keeps me engaged and interested in this work. And yeah. Right. Um, so uh, one kind of last question, I think we're running, we're running towards the end is, you know, I think oftentimes in this setting says, like, would you do it again? And I, I don't really like that question because we're like, I will do it, but um, but if you could think of one thing about where you've been going into it, now now that you've gone through it, say you know I would have contacted my supervisor sooner, I would have read this, or I would have liked to my supervisor to tell me that, or have this conversation, or maybe nothing. Right? Maybe it was good how you went in, but uh, just thinking about people that are preparing to go into their internships, um, it might help to think about. What you didn't do that now, in hindsight, you would have done to prepare better for it, if there's anything. I think I'd be more proactive in reaching out to my supervisor, um, my coworkers, and also asking for support with like professional support. Um, in the work, uh, the way that my internship kind of went about, I loved it because I was kind of thrown into the work. We, like my first day, I met with my supervisor for like two minutes, and then she was like, I, I you know, do a memo, like, give it to me. And I honestly loved that, but I think that I was hesitant to ask for help because I'm shy. Um, but as soon as I asked for help, everybody was so open and willing to help me. I was like, why in the world would I have waited so long? Um, and also my supervisor later on asked me like if there was any types of experiences that I wanted to have. Um, but I wish that I had been more proactive in asking for those experiences because they were very willing to offer them to me. 
Um, but yeah, it's kind of about taking agency and like being proactive in your own goals and what you want to have this summer experience be like. Yeah, I think as someone said, like, especially working in a small org, you can wear a lot of hats and that's awesome. But um, something I wish I'd done was make sure that I had my role pretty clearly defined. Um, I found that I was doing a lot more work than um, I thought I was going to be. I didn't know that I was going to be supervising the whole staff before I started my job. Um, and while I probably still would have taken my job, that would have been good to know in terms of preparation. So I think especially at a small org, even if it's awkward, um, you need to be having honest conversations with your supervisor about what is expected of you um, in your role. Um, just to piggyback off of Audra's point about agency, I think in retrospect, I wish I would have maybe asked for more tasks. I feel like sometimes I just got very comfortable with what I was doing. I don't think, yeah, I could have asked for more. Um, they were doing like something with refugees in the DRC too. And I'm also interested in refugee work. Um, so in retrospect, I wish I would have maybe asked to like, be given a task to help with that um yeah so just asking for more work if you have the capacity to do so and if it interests you yeah I think uh we made a plan sheet before we went into our internship but I didn't know what exactly what I was going to be doing until I was actually there so I think revisiting that she would have been a good idea and like maybe we like planning it out in my head and setting more like weekly um goals that were more like specific to my job um would have been helpful because um I think what I was doing was really like productive and I did a lot of good things that I am proud of but I think also at times I was a little like confused on what I should be doing or like I didn't have specific goals and I think um that having specific goals would have made my internship experience um better like more um oriented less chaotic feeling great well uh we can join in and give a panelist a round of us and uh, thank you guys um we are really good hearing uh about your experiences and um yeah thank you keep connected with the process thank you, thank you.